Hey, hey, hey. Oh, look. Oh, yes. I was like, I always forget our damn intro. Sorry, y'all. Hey, hey, hey. We're back. We're black. We're brown. Ambition, 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 ambition. We're extra black brown today in the stew. We have a guest today. Her name is Lacey Robinson. Let me read you a little taste about Miss Lacey. First of all, she is an educator like myself. So you already know it's on like Donkey Kong. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> Lacey is the president and CEO of Unbounded, which is an education organization that offers standard that offers standards aligned resources and immersive professional learning for teachers and leaders seeking seeking equity. She has over 20 years of experience in education and focuses on helping educators in school systems to disrupt systemic racism and its legacies. Yes. Oh, and she's the author of a new book. See, if y'all watch me on YouTube, like I be telling y'all, you can see the book. It's beautiful yellow. It is called <laughs> Justice Seekers, Pursuing Equity yeah. in the Details of Teaching and Learning. Yes, we both got our books out. Okay. <laughs> You know, you know, black goes so good with yellow. You see what I mean? See, look at look at that look. And so, look, and so does blue. Let's oh, get my book, get your money. So, welcome to the podcast, Lacey. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> well, first, let me so tell you, excited. like, how I met Lacey. She just, you oh know, you gosh. just meet somebody's dope. I'm not gonna tell all your business, girl. But just like you know, you just meet a dope black woman on social media. Like, we should connect. And then we literally did, it was just on some like, hey girl, hey. And then we spoke for like three hours. <laughs> oh my God. I told somebody, I was like, if that had been a first date, that would have been the perfect first date. Like, yes. like, oh my God, I met my spirit. I met my spirit person. I know. And I, I've never even seen her in person. But <laughs> Yes. It was honestly, it was also, we just like, you know, some people you just connect with that like, yeah. literally that's what it was. We got connected on social media. Had a yeah. phone call that I thought would be like, oh, 20, 30 minutes. No. <laughs> like, I took Lacey on a walk with me. I walk, we talk, we cry, we laugh, child. This is my BFF now. Okay. <laughs> and so when I saw that she had a book coming out, I was like, um, hello, come on the podcast. Hello, let's promote this book. You know? But Thank honestly, you so much. your story is so interesting, Lacey, because so many of our listeners have like pivot stories, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would love for you to kind of share how, because one... Um, Y'all might not be familiar with Unbounded, but it's not a small um, nonprofit. You know, they got a, <laughs> they got a big budget, right, Lacey? What are we talking about, like 60, 60 million? Oh, shoot. Million? We, on, we on our way there. I, I'd say close to 40, 43, you know. Oh, only 40 million, you know, something like. <laughs> we have we have a for-profit and nonprofit side. Okay. Um, my goal is 100 million. Yes. You know. Because why not? Um, I mean, dream, right? But, yes. I mean, into reality. So, um, and I have, we, I, I, we, we're about a, 110 employees across mm. the United States. Um, and so we do three national convenings. I have the next final convening that's happening this season in DC next mm. week. Um, last month in June, we had our uh, Standards Institute convening where almost 2000 educators from across mm. the United States got together and for an entire week and did what we call made their brain sweat around standards, aligned curriculum, and the equity that is essential um, to close the opportunity gap here in the United States. So um, just super excited and feel really blessed uh, to lead this organization. So I love that. So how, but you didn't always, obviously, no one starts off as a president and CEO. <laughs> and right. So, so what was your trajectory? Like, how did you get here? Oh my gosh. Okay. So like you, I started out as an early childhood teacher. I okay. actually taught in an early childhood center to put myself through undergrad. Okay. I went to the Florida A&M University. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, honestly, I didn't really want to be a teacher. <laughs> I wanted to be an actress. Okay. And my mother was like, mm, I'm going to need you to get a 401k and have some health benefits. <laughs> and so she's like, I've watched you as from the time you were a child. I, you love children. You mm -hmm. love reading. You love teaching people. And you're a little bit bossy. <laughs> so I think you should try being a teacher. And so I went into the teaching profession. I started an undergrad. And um, by the time I reached my junior year, it became a calling. Like I could literally feel my spirit lift and soar when I thought about the potential that is yielded in a classroom when you have the right mix of a teacher mm. Uh, that is dedicated, that is well-prepared, that has the passion 
students, regardless of social economic status, regardless of background, but have that desire, you know, that desire that like the three and four year olds have when they're learning yes. and the hunger, uh, the right materials, the support, like when all those things are mixed in, I'm telling you, you know, this firsthand magic happens in yes. classrooms. We see it on a daily basis. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's what started to drive me from there. Honestly, it was a set of unforeseen opportunities that I never said no to. So when I went to do my residency, somebody said, you should go observe Marva Collins Preparatory School in Cincinnati. If no one knows about Marva Collins, please look her up. She is, I'd say, one of my original sheroes, African-American woman in the city of Chicago, had enough with the way her kids were being schooled and decided to open up her own classroom in her living room in mm -hmm. Chicago. And word got out in the neighborhood that her kids were not only learning, but excelling. And the neighbors started bringing their kids. And now all of a sudden her living room is packed. Mm -hmm. And regardless of where the students were, they were learning Shakespeare and Chaucer and algebra. Like she had just this insurmountable belief that brown and black children have all the potential mm -hmm. to become whatever they want. And when we set the right environment for them, they can learn. So I got an opportunity to intern in a school that was modeled after her schools. Um, I got an opportunity to go live in Germany and observe after school programs on Dodds and also get opportunity to look at how kindergarten is done mm -hmm. in Europe, very different. Um, I got an opportunity to go to Columbia University and work for someone who's a really big guru, who I'm not gonna say their name. <laughs> My first lint sent around professional development. I didn't even know there was a career, professional <laughs> development. I thought you could be a teacher or a principal. <laughs> but a professional developer, I, I never that. even heard of it. Um, and then became a principal with new leaders, started to work for new leaders after mm -hmm. becoming a turnaround principal coaching. And then lo and behold, honey, I went and applied to this company called Unbound Ed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Didn't get the job the first time around, which is <laughs> I always tell people is a testimony. Okay. Because mm -hmm. every, no no. right? every, every no ain't no. Right? Every no ain't no. And, um, they didn't, they didn't hire me, but they said, come back and facilitate at one of our national convenings. And I did that. And all of my, I would say, gifts and talents showed. And they invited me to apply again for a job um, at Unbound Ed. And I worked, first I was a senior director. That's the other thing too. Get in. Mm -hmm. Because if it's meant to be, you will fit in. Yeah. Okay? If, if you have gifts and talents and those gifts and talents have an opportunity to shine. Don't worry about what level you come in on because those gifts and talents are going to carry you. And that's what happened. Month after month, I kept getting a promotion to the point where my mother was like, now, what is you doing over there? They promote you every three to four months. And I went from senior director to chief and then got an opportunity where uh, they allowed me to take their standards institute, their national convening and add some touches to it and shift it and make it about equity, which is one of our pervasive issues in education today. Mm -hmm. And we took off our sales, our revenue soared. Mm -hmm. We started getting wait lists for people to come to our institutes. And um, my board at the time needed to replace the CEO and came to me and said, do you want to do it? Wow. From and preschool like teacher teachers. to president Girl. and CEO. <laughs> Girl, of a little light something, $40 million, you know. <laughs> like, what? I just, I hope listening to that, y'all are like, okay, you know, that, you know, sometimes you think you're stuck in a place or how are your skills transferable, but they are. Yes. You know, they are. Yes. Especially, I want all, I hope. Educators, because I know mm -hmm. it's tons of them that listen to mm -hmm. you and follow me. I want them to understand something. Number one, your gifts and talents are beyond measurable. Yeah. We can only capture a snapshot in that evaluation if it's any good. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we are some of the most creative. I mean, look at yourself. Uh, self sufficient, MacGyvering kind of <laughs> professionals you will find. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And I think you also have to allow yourself time to develop. Yeah. Who said you got to drop into a career and be instamatic? Yes. <laughs> no, it's true. I think that like, 
I think so many of us don't realize, like I, I taught for 10 years and then that it was that school. People always ask me, what do I credit the success of the budget needs to? And I'm like that preschool classroom. I yeah. learned all I need to learn about leadership, about presentation, yep. about different personalities, about yep. like, you know, about management. I mean, because yep. you're doing it all. And so, so many of the skills, like I, I saw this really fun meme about like um, for stay at home moms who think they can't jo- join the workforce and it mm. listed all of the the mm-hmm. skill sets that these stay at home moms have that mm-hmm. absolutely trans, you know, translate into the workforce. So, no, I love that. Yep. So yes. what made you decide with all of this knowledge and all of this, um, ex- all these experience, is this your first book, Justice Seekers? It is. It's my first okay. published book. Yeah. So yeah. what made you decide to write it? Well, I will tell you, I've been a storyteller since I was a child. Um, storytelling runs in my family. Um, I always dreamt of being a writer from the time I think I was like five years old. Um, never thought it, my first would be a nonfiction piece, but it's a passion piece that I did with the organization. Um, and I do keynotes. I do national keynotes around the United States um, and began to notice that the keynotes started going viral. Mm. Um, a big chunk of the keynotes is my own personal journey. I got an opportunity, which is rare, Tiffany. I got an opportunity to stand on stage in front of what I call the edgy sphere and make my confessionals about being an educator, right? Like (laughs) admitting that I did not always have the greatest learning environment for my students because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the nuances on how to teach reading. And I tried my hardest to get my kids to learn, but without the proper professional development, I was a miss, Mm -hmm. you know? I, I was a middle school turnaround principal and I allowed the system to put a cloud of of unbelief in my students over me Mm -hmm. because of the zip codes they lived in, Mm. because of their social economic status, because of the former reputation that the school had. And rather than see my kids for the beauty and the gifts and the talents and who they were, I saw them as this group of people that in some instances were nuanced, you know, were nuisances to the system. Mm. And I made mistakes. I wanted them to excel, but I wanted them to excel with assimilationist lens because I thought that was the way that I made it. Mm. And it wasn't until I left the principalship and I had, a t- I had time to sit back and think as an educator and realize that my own internal meter about who I was as a Black woman, as a Black child, as a Black student, who I showed up as a teacher and a principal was based off of my own internalized racist beliefs and values. Mm. And that there were times, as much as I believed in my students, those values superseded what I did. And so as I started to reflect, I started writing to tell the story. I looked at the keynotes that I did and I said, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to seek justice. Mm. Justice for our students, justice for our teachers, but most importantly, justice for this nation. Um, Because we're at a time where we don't have anything, any more time to waste. Yeah. So I I started writing it down and I kept saying to people in the org, I was like, I got a book, I got a book, (laughs) I got a book. And they were like, Lacey, if you say you're going to do it, we know you're going to do it, go and write it. (laughs) No, I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got help from Unbounded Ed community. I got mm-hmm. people in the community, smart people, superheroes, I call them. Um, but that's what the book is. It's an amalgamation of my story as a student, teacher, principal. Mm-hmm. Our story is Unbounded. No, I love that. So what do you, well, one, this is like, aside from the book, what do you think some of the, because one of my friends, um, Dr. Ortiz, we got to put some respect on her name. Um, but Maria, to me, uh, Maria is a um, vice superintendent of uh, Newark Public Schools, which is the largest school district in, yes. um, in New Jersey. And she was just sharing, like, what a hard time they're having recruiting teachers mm-hmm. just because it's such a crazy time. I know I left the classroom because it was too much. Um, mm-hmm. But as if someone is listening and is considering going into education or they are a teacher already What can they do to be a justice seeker? Because like you said, sometimes you have this own bias that you bring in with Mm -hmm. you. Because I'm not going to lie, until I grew up in a very African household, 
And then mm-hmm. I went to, I, but in school, my school, I lived in Westfield largely, which was very um, white. Um, yeah. And so it was like African at home, white at school. Yes. Um, and so I had not, although I am black, I had not had a lot of um, access to black American, you know, like, of course it's not a monolith, but the experience, you know? Yes. Um, not fully and completely because I, like at home, I just didn't get that, you know? Um, so when I got to teach in Newark, you know, of course, Newark, like I said, does not represent all black, the whole African-American experience. But one of the things I brought with me was if you just work hard enough, the bootstraps, come, you know, like the same as you. And I was like, yeah. girl, bootstraps, like, you know. And then I came to teach in this preschool where the babies were so smart. Our kids are so mm. daggone smart. But they were also coming to say, like, um, I remember we went to the park once and one of the little boys got poked by a needle that was left behind. And I was like, what? And I just remember, like, so my classroom was at the bottom of a of a senior um, building, but also SSI, so social security. So a lot of people that had mental issues and, but also there was a lot of drug dealing in the building. And I distinctly remember having to decide, because we had a closet on the third floor for the kids, like, you know, like paper and scissors, any excess materials. So every time I had to go to the closet, I had to decide, do I want to take this elevator and maybe get stuck in the small elevator with someone who Mm. is not in their right mind? Or do I take the stairs where you don't know what you're going to see? I mean, I have seen in action prostitution happening. One time I ran up the stairs and I smelled the sickly sweet smell. And when I looked, someone was literally smoking crack. And I said, wait, how is the baby supposed to come to school talking about ABCs? One, two, three. Like I said, this is obviously, I know this is not the, the, I don't want to misconstrue thinking that this is the African-American experience across the board, but I had never experienced that this is, that this is what, my kids, kids could be experiencing because I was 22, oh, yeah. 23 and I was blown away. And I threw, that made me throw out the whole bootstraps, girl, I'm, I'm barely making it. It was, yeah. it was hurting my spirit. How is a four-year-old supposed to learn? So the question is, if someone is, if someone wants to be a justice seeker, how does mm-hmm. someone kind of get past the bias that they might bring into the classroom that's harmful for kids? Well, first and foremost, let me say this. Your experience that you're talking about, there are hundreds of thousands of other educators across the United States experience the same thing. I used to call it the Robin Hood mentality I had. Mm-hmm. I had made up in my mind that in, in some years I wanted to go and work in um, what they call urban districts, you mm-hmm. know, the districts that are uh, mostly brown and black. Um, some indigenous students, um, low socioeconomic status. And in other years, I would push myself to go work in the suburbs because mm-hmm. I wanted to see like, okay, the kids in the suburbs, the teachers in the suburbs, it sounded like the land of good and plenty. But what I began to understand, and I talk about this in Justice Seekers, is that the teachers in the suburbs were just as ill-prepared mm-hmm. as the teachers in the, in, the, in, in the urban city schools that I taught in. Mm-hmm. And that it wasn't, yes, were materials a plenty? Yes were experiences a plenty in those suburbs yes but teachers on average did not get supported Mm -hmm. and so the first thing i tell people about becoming a justice seeker is one come and join us right Mm -hmm. come and join our community i call it the edu sphere you don't have to walk this road alone uh there are uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of us across the united states um We have our national convenings we invite people to, but we also have online opportunities. Um, We have a a, a platform called the ecosystem where you could go on and join a community. You teach third grade and you want to know, you want to hook up with other third grade teachers from across Mm -hmm. the United States. Our ecosystem offers that. And I will say this, find your edges here locally, right? Make sure that you are building community within your building and across schools and other educators. We got Facebook. We got Instagram. Mm. Start a collective educator page where you all are coming together locally to support in, in one another. Here's the other thing. The professional development. That's one of the biggest issues, I believe, in our profession. Tiffany, if you went to a doctor and you had a cold and you told the doctor that you're, you had a cold and your throat was sore. Mm-hmm. And the doctor pick said, let me see your foot. And you say, well, wait a minute. Now, I said that my throat was sore. What you looking at my foot for? And the doctor said, you know, I, they, I ain't really get a chance to study Gray's Anatomy. I got to the foot and, you know, and I ain't really had to. You would, you would take your paper gown <laughs> and gather your things, ma'am, and walk up out that office. Exactly. When you look at educators, 
I believe our profession is not looked upon the same as other professions. We don't mm -hmm. receive this, the same kind of professional development that is ongoing, consistent, and comprehensive, that is up to date around research and development, that looks at the landscape of global majority le learners and gets us to ask the question, how do I teach students and allow them to come to school as their whole selves. Mm. How do I teach my students academic English while honoring their home language at the same time? And so I tell educators all the time, you gotta find a network where you are professionally developing yourself. You gotta ask the system, what's the professional development you're providing me on teaching and reading? How do I become a better math teacher? So those are the pieces that I, I really try to push for folks. Join us as a community. Find your community local. Look at the professional development that you're being doused with. Um, and for God's sakes, this is the last piece. Okay. You got to do a self-examination. Mm -hmm. You got to ask yourself, why am I standing in the middle of this classroom? What is it that I, what is it that I as a profession, what am I looking for? What am I seeking? And what is it that I can offer my students standing before me? Um, I think when a lot of people ask themselves that question, did you become a teacher because you couldn't think of anything else to do? Mm, I hear that sometimes, yep. And if that's the case, honey, I, you need to go on Indeed, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because true. this profession is worthy of those who deem it as essential as their passion, yeah. as something that they want to grow in, just like being a doctor, a lawyer, a candlestick maker or a baker. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> no, but it's true though. Like it's not, I used to always tell like my, when I first started teaching, I, you know, I had some coworkers that didn't really um, share my enthusiasm for teaching. And I used to say, you know, if we were packing boxes, girl, I wouldn't care. You could do whatever. You could cheat on the job. You could, I'm like, oh, you cutting out early. You could do all that stuff. I'm like, we packing boxes, girl. I said, but these are kids. Yeah. This is the same kid that's going to either take your purse or stitch you up in the hospital, how you want it to go. Yeah. You know, like these are kids. And so yeah. you don't get to say, you know, I don't feel like I don't want to know. Like, sorry, this is not the yeah. kind of profession. There's no space for that here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 They're our greatest commodity. Don't you ever think about that as a nation? Our greatest commodity mm -hmm. is our youth. It's the future. None of this AI or infrastructure or flying to Mars is ever going to continue mm -hmm. unless we properly educate the entire masses. You about to there are I believe the children <laughs> are future. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the way. Some of y'all too young. Man. Some of y'all gonna have to tap your mama on the shoulder and say, what song is that? Show them all the beauty they possess. Google it. The children are the future. The late, great Whitney. Okay. <laughs> All of us knew that song. We sang that song like, give us a sense of pride. I feel like every like graduation or whatever during that time, like we all sang that song. But, um, and the babies yeah. and the children. The children yes. have to learn the song too. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, okay. So if I am reading your book, Justice Seekers, what do you hope that maybe an educator or non-educator, what do you mm. hope they people take away? Like, what do you hope... What changes, what hope, I guess, like mentally you, th you hope they take away and emotionally, but also what changes you hope, you know, that they enact in their lives as a result of reading it? Yeah. Well, I say Justice Seekers is my love letter to educators, mm. you know, um, I, and I really, truly mean that. Like, you know, you get a love letter and the person is espousing how much they care about you, but they're also telling you like what they're concerned about, mm. you know, and what they appreciate about you, appreciate about you and what they want to see in the future, you know? And that's what this is. It's my love letter to the edusphere. It's my love letter to the students. And most importantly, I'm gonna say it's my love letter to this nation, because mm -hmm. here's the thing. I, when I wrote and decided to include my own personal stories in the book, and this is something I do in my keynotes, you know, I'm the first to step out to be like, hey, guess what? <laughs> I made the mistake. If mm. I, as an African-American woman who grew up in a single mother household with some powerful figures, right? With some powerful people behind me telling me, you can do it. You know, you, you are, your, you are your, your best cheerleader. You know, it doesn't matter what they think about you. Keep going. If I had all of that, and just like you, attended predominantly white schools, 
and still got the message I wasn't good enough and still got the message I wasn't included Mm -hmm. and very rarely had the opportunity to read, see, or hear from people that look like me, let alone the history that my people um, have been a part of in this country. And dare I say the main character in this country. If out of all of that, after finishing my K-12 experience, I still grappled with who I was. And it wasn't until I attended the HBCU that it got hammered home how brilliant, how bright. And Mm. yes, you might struggle in math, Lacey, but guess what? We can get you to proficient. We can get you to proficient because we believe in you. Mm. And so I use those stories of what I thought I knew when I knew better. I use the stories of the observations that I've had the privilege of having with teachers and leaders and students. Those moments, you know, there's a little girl I talk about in the book. I was doing a walkthrough in New Orleans and I think about this and it brings tears to my eyes. A couple years ago, I was in a fifth grade math class and a little black girl braided long hair, beautiful, all cocoa buttered up. You know, <laughs> you could tell somebody took take care of putting, pressing down her edges and had all the bowls in her hair. And they were in a math class just doing this rote three plus three is six. Fifth grade now. Mm. And I'm walking through the classroom and she grabs my arm and pulls me down and says, will you be our teacher, please? Please, will you be our teacher? And it's in those moments Mm -hmm. as an educator that I was just ripped apart because I knew what she was asking me. Mm -hmm. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Could you come and care enough about me and what I'm learning? And that's not a dig on the teacher that was in front of the student who wasn't prepared. I'm going to say that. (laughs) Even the principal admitted the teacher wasn't prepared. Mm -hmm. Not the teacher's fault, but the system's fault. Uh, And so it's those moments I talk about in the book. I have a real truth and telling moment in us as a nation in the role that African-Americans, Indigenous, Mm -hmm. Latinx, and other people of color have played in the role of education, the misguidedness. Um, And so I invite people to not just read the stories, but to answer the questions in the text about themselves and their systems and their schools. Mm. So I know you probably have heard the statistic by the by 2044 um, oh, yeah. that we will be the for the first time in this country's history a uh, majority minority country. Yes. And so, what does that spell for education if the minority of pe- majority of people will no longer be white? That it will be black, brown, and indigenous. Indigenous. Like, what does that look like in the education system? How how much more important is it to have black, brown, and indigenous teachers knowing yes. that? you know, that we will be overly represented in the the general population. It looks like the warning signs that are going off now, Mm -hmm. the warning signs, we, we are literally at a place, you know, you know, when your fire alarm goes off when you, Mm -hmm. you you overcooked your food and it's like, it's, that is actually happening in education right now. Mm -hmm. And people want to blame it on COVID, but I got news for you. We were already in an educational pandemic before the health pandemic even happened. Mm -hmm. We were already starting to see the signs that we as a nation weren't paying close enough to the development of educators, that we as a nation weren't paying close enough to the pay. You know this and you talk about this as Mm -hmm. an educator and the amount of sacrifice that is expected of you, even though you got to pay bills, meet your mortgage, feed your kids, support your family, like everybody else. Yeah. We as a nation, the warning signs have been going off since before Brown and Board of Education that mm-hmm. in order to educate us all, in order for this to be these United States where the pursuit of happiness is part of our creed, you have to educate your masses. Yeah. Horace Mann said that when he proposed public school. And so the warning signs are going off. One, all students are struggling. Mm-hmm. But prior to all students are struggling, Brown and black students pervasively have been underserved in these United States. I double dog dare somebody to go to their local system and ask for the data and not see the trend Mm -hmm. of brown and black students versus their white peers. Second of all, our GDP, wait a minute, now speaking your language, (laughs) our GDP is at risk Mm -hmm. because if you don't educate the masses, if they can't read, if Mm -hmm. they can't write, wait a minute, now I'm really about to touch on 
I believe this is the world according to lace. <laughs> the reason why your work is so essential is because mm -hmm. you're counteracting the first misstep that happens. And you already know what I'm about to say. People have a phobia about math. Yeah. They have a phobia about numbers. Brown and black people, nine times out of 10, aren't shown the representation, the gifts and talents, mm -hmm. aren't told that you have the innate ability to be a mathematician, mm -hmm. a financial analysis. And so what ends up happening? You, you become scared of numbers, let alone budgets. We're mm -hmm. talking about just numbers. <laughs> and I dream of a day where your work gets magnified because we have educated the masses of brown and black children to understand that they have mathematical ability. They understand the concepts and the foundational skills, and they can be applied to budgets, engineering, food service, anything. So that is our warning sign. Now, the cohorts of teachers that are needed, and I talk about this in the book. First of all, brown and black teachers are needed to keep Jerome and Anna in place. That's how they've been tried, been used in the past. Mm -hmm. They are needed because all students need to see representation. Yes. All students need to understand that people who are not from where you're from can't be discounted, have to be included. And if we are to continue to be these United States, we have to start to educate our youth around that. So I'm going to say this about the teaching force. Do you believe the teaching force would be different if the salaries were different? I think so. What do you mean different Why? as in a better teaching force? Mm -hmm. do, you think the te do you think we would be in such a dire need for teachers if, if they were paid the way that they should be paid? I think in part, yes. I mean, I think also like a lot of teachers teach because they obviously for the love, not for the money. Um, mm -hmm. But also too, I think it's not just the money. For me, it was also just the lack of support. So I think mm -hmm. in, in some part that, yes, you would maybe have more teachers apply. But like, for example, I look, I hear Maria talking, Newark pays well. Okay. okay. They pay very well. And yet they're still struggling to like, yes. you know, attract teachers. So I don't think it's just the money. I think it's also like, is there a system in place to support these teachers when, once they have the job? It's the money. It's the system. Now let's look at this. It's the legacies of community. So think about this. You want to increase brown, black, indigenous communities in education? You can't ignore their financial histories that they've mm -hmm. had. So even though, and I'm not saying Newark doesn't pay well, because I've seen their pay scale. It pays mm -hmm. well. But I want you to think about, you're somebody that's being moved into a pay scale who, whose financial legacy has never had a leg up, mm -hmm. right? So let's say you took out student loans, you're, your mama, your daddy, your grandmother, your auntie, they couldn't help you get through school. You got the student loans. You already know what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. You're already behind. You probably credit card your way through mm -hmm. school and where you are. Now you're in newer public schools making the salary, but it's not quite cutting it yet. And what ends up happening? You have to go work a second job, right? Mm -hmm. To not just pay your bills, but to try to catch up from all of the financial yeah. legacy that you had missing. So it is, it's the salary. It's the professional development. It's getting providing opportunities for educators to get a leg up. You want to talk about removing student loan? Maybe we should start with the education force first and yeah. really mean it and really mean it. There needs to be more education around folks like you coming into our school systems and saying to brown and black cohorts of educators, let's talk about how we can build your budget. Let's talk mm -hmm. about how we can start financial legacies so that you can get down into the passion of teaching. There yes. is a revolution that needs to happen in the teaching yes. profession. If you want the brown and black communities to play a role in it, don't ignore their financial legacies yes. that have been absent. And I think if we start to answer those questions, the professional development, paying them well, acknowledge how we can support them in building healthy financial legacies for themselves, then that takes the burden off of yes. getting into the passion of teaching. It's true. Because honestly, when I think about when I was teaching, I mean, I was pay making decent money for the time at, at preschool. I was making 39000 But then mm -hmm. I still tutored on the side because I needed the extra money. You know, I still babysat on the side. And See? that made me an extra like five or $6,000 a year. 
you know, mm-hmm. to try to close some gaps. So no, absolutely. And I, I love that you're right, that I think folks don't understand. I mean, well, the folks listening, you know, y'all are brown ambition, but folks who are not a part of this community do not understand that my 100000 that I make is not the same as someone who's white and the 100000 that they make because they on, make man. the 100000 for them. Like, on, Tasha is the first girl to go. She's the first to go to college. So she it's the 100000 for her, for granny, for cuzzo, for mm-hmm. mom, for dad. For It's like that money. And then on top of that, you took out student loans because other people did not have to do so. And Come so on. on top of that, you're trying to like, you don't literally get to start at zero and build. You know, yep. we're literally starting at negative 100,000, negative 200,000. And yep. so it's not the same. That money is not created equally. So no, no absolutely. And, and, and Tiffany, imagine this. If you didn't have to tutor, if you didn't have to babysit, mm-hmm. could you have imagined using your time in, in bettering your, yourself in your profession? Yeah. Maybe taking a class, reading a book, joining a group. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think about that and the impact that it has on communities that we're inviting, that we want to be a part of this edu- educational landscape, you got to take all that into consideration. Yeah. I love that because it, it's not because what I'm learning more and more about my community is that it's not just throwing money at the answer. You know, exactly. It's, that's I mean, I've been lately been on my soapbox trying to strong arm these organizations to say like, yo, I've been teaching financial education for the last 15 years. I've not built an online school that teaches financial education. I have yeah. subsidized so many, over a hundred thousand students have joined um, my online school, the Literature Academy, and we keep the cost as low as possible. I have been subsidizing, you know, so much of that, just even just this year, we had a financial education challenge that was totally free. And we educated 280,000 people. But why I always got to come out of pocket. Where are you, big banks? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you yeah. want me to tap dance for you on your, to be a, a spokesperson? Why I always got to come out of pocket? Mm-hmm. You know, like, mm-hmm. and I'm just, I'm just like, no, I'm holding them to task. You come mm-hmm. see me. No, tell me how you are going to subsidize black and brown mm-hmm. people getting free financial education. I got a school. It works. Mm-hmm. It's seven years old. We've already, we've already educated a hundred thousand uh, people. Subsidize that, you know, yeah. like I would love yeah. to be able to say to your point, Lacey, like, Hey, you know, we have all these educators that unbounded. Why not, why not fund them to have free access for one year to the literature academy? Why, yes. why do I always have to pay for that? You know? Yes. You know? And yes. so you just be surprised because these companies have, I mean, I have gotten contracts that are multiple six and seven figures to do next, mm-hmm. not, not multiple seven, like from my lips to God's ears one day, <laughs> but multiple <laughs> six figure <laughs> contracts to, you know, to do next to nothing as the budgetista, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a little live here on, on a stage there. And that's cute. And I'm grateful for it, you know, and mm-hmm. I pour back in the, into the community and the company, but I would honestly would really love instead to say, Hey, how much can 500,000, how many students can we, can we educate for 500,000? How many students can we educate for a million? You know, and then not students like kids. I'm talking about these grown people who are like, I, I, if I didn't have to worry about my personal finances, then I could be present here for these babies. So I I, I I mean, think about the revolution. We about to start, honey. We about to start a revolution because (laughs) think about the revolution that you, we could have if your financial university became a part of the scope and sequence for uh, undergraduates that are going yes. into education, yes. you know, what if the alternative program said, come and join us. We'll, we'll not only teach you how to be a teacher, but we'll also t- get you into the financial university so you can learn more about budget. Yes. This is my question to you. And I, this ain't no dig and don't send me no emails and snaps <laughs> or whatever y'all send out. But riddle me this. We prepare professional athletes mm-hmm. better than we prepare professional educators mm-hmm. for their budgets and beyond. And I, don't, I ain't talking about, you know, some people be like, well, there's, there's, there's some places that offer, you can buy a house and honey, if you see some of them houses, they be offering educated. First of all, you, you and your husband or your spouse going to have to be Bob the builder in order to even <laughs> move into it. Yes. I'm talking about beyond that. I'm talking about educating them yes. so that they understand that I can be a teacher. I can be an educator and I don't have to babysit and tutor. I mm-hmm. can figure out how to create a budget, how to save, how to have vacation money. Yeah. How to, how, you know what I mean? What, what about your taxes? I say, I used to say this as an educator. I wish somebody would come and teach me how to write off the, all these materials I ended up buying Girl. as a teacher. Okay. Okay. 
Because this bitch can't become your kid. You just at, you at the local Walmart buying 15 juices. 15. One lady was like, how many kids do you have? When I used to be a teacher. I literally used to set aside money from my paycheck for my baby. Yes! Because you yes! cannot as a teacher. It's literally impossible as a teacher not to invest some of your own money because there is a gap. So, no, you're right. And honestly, that's the soap opera that I'm on now. I am holding brands and things that reach out to me to task to say, all that's good on what you want me to do. You want me to dance for a dollar? Then do this for me. Mm-hmm. You know, not even for me. Do this for this community. That my father would always say, every time we graduated, like, from high school or college or advanced degree, he would give the same speech to me and my four sisters. He would always say, you are now at a different level of life because of this education that you've now acquired. And the beautiful thing about knowledge is knowledge once given can never be rescinded. They can't take this back from you, baby. And so that's the thing. I am here as a result of my father. um, He's in his 80s now, but... Um, as a, as a, he has his master's in, in um, economics and his, his bachelor's in finance. And so he poured that financial education to my sisters and I. So it allowed me to choose what I wanted to do based yes. upon what I love to do, you know, yes. because I was able to budget. I was able to learn how to save and start investing and all those things. Even now start with starting the budget Nista. I was able to do those things because I knew how to live well below my means. So I would yes. have the space to do this thing that I'm doing now. And I always wonder, like, you know, how could that be different for other people? So I am on my soapbox crusade to get every black and brown person access to financial education, but meaningful, culturally relevant. Because people are like, well, they could just Google meaningful, culturally <laughs> relevant financial education. Because some of the stuff out here, even I'm like, what did he say now? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> or you tell me, you know, you telling me like, oh, oh you talking about um, pulling myself up by the, my, my shoestring. Oh, you one of those. No, I'm good. No, meaningful, yeah. culturally relevant financial education that makes sense for who I am and how I show up in this world. And yeah. so like, yeah, we, I, that's, so we're going to talk later. So like, what do I got to do? Cause I'm, I'm already been partnered. There's a, um, I guess I'll announce later, but there's a nonprofit that that's already agreed a huge one that everybody knows their name, um, okay. to already agree to kind of like, like work with us behind the scenes to basically kind of white label yeah. our online school because oftentimes, which is so crazy, a, a brand or a bank or a funder or whatever will be like, hey, nonprofit, we want to give you a bajillion dollars to do this financial education thing. And they're like, well, why don't you go, girl, this is a black owned financial mm-hmm. education company that's been existing. Oh, no, no. But the minute you white label, it's the nonprofit. <laughs> oh, child, here's all the, well, we got to do all that. So I said, all right, cute. That's what we're going to do. Go ahead and white label what we've already created and already vetted. I mean, I had these women from Stanford come and do all, uh, and I, cause I wanted to, uh, to, to make sure all my research and everything that I believed was true was true. We made some changes based upon what they said. We retaped everything. It's just like, it's frustrating because when I show up in all my black and brownness and womanness, yeah. you know, yeah. there's doubt about what I'm capable of, but you slap, you know, like, some, you know, mm. old ancient, like, you know, name on it. And all of a sudden mm. it's valuable. And if that's the game I have to play to get financial education to black and brown people for free, then so be it. And so that's I the mean, game we're playing right now. You singing my song, honey. We, we can start a choir because <laughs> I feel like I, I, I say this to people all the time. Okay. I went to Columbia University Teachers College, right? Mm. I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't go to Yale, you know, and I, I have the sheer audacity as a student, as an educator, as a leader in education to stand on my platforms and to announce, you know, our our equitable charges to mm-hmm. talk about, um, we have a framework that's called GLEAM. Is a grade level engaging, affirming, meaningful instruction for all mm-hmm. students, you know? And you are absolutely right. I had to authorize myself, right? Which is what we often have to do as people of color, particularly as women of color mm-hmm. and, once I authorized myself, the edge sphere got up behind me and authorized mm-hmm. me as well. And I and I see and I know that to be true about you and what you're mm-hmm. doing, but you are absolutely right. We are, there has to be some sort of white label or stamp to say Sometimes, like, okay, yeah. this person is, and not just from sheer, I mean, when you think about your story, the sheer experience alone yeah. authorizes you to get up in front of the masses and speak. And that should be enough because guess what? It's enough for some other people. Yes. Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> No, but it's true. But you know, the fight continues. You the know fight saying? continues. <laughs> so, Lacey, where, where, where can the? Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say we go, we gonna run. We, I believe we gonna run on and see what the end gonna be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I, I haven't lost yet. Okay. <laughs> so, where can if the people want to buy Justice Seekers, oh, right? Your book, yes. Pursuing Equity in the Details of Teaching and Learning. Where can the people get your book? Oh my gosh, Amazon, Target. Mm-hmm. Barnes okay. and Nobles, any of your online bookstores. Okay. Um, I've just literally um, received a message today that people in Australia are starting to yes. buy the book. Um, and so, and also bookstores, you know, bookstores, when the, when the book demands come, they will start to fill up the shelves uh, mm-hmm. in the actual retail stores. But we've received just a huge, huge amount of support. It came out as number one in new releases in its category in Amazon. Mm. Um, and so the edge sphere is showing up and showing out and spreading the word. So yes, I would say also go to unboundedorg If you go to our landing page, it'll not only tell you where to purchase the book, but it'll tell you how to sit shoulder to shoulder with us in the work. Um, mm. So yeah. I love it. And where can they connect with you? I mean, you know, I don't know how much you want them to be on your business and um, on social media, but <laughs> I don't know. Right. If they want to follow you and connect, because I always see you on somebody's stage, I'd be like, yes, yes. I'm like, well, how many more yes I got to say? She's on stage every day. I'm going to just start hearting it like heart, heart. <laughs> if the people want to follow an amazing black woman doing her thing in this space, where do you feel comfortable them following you on social media? So they can find us on Instagram at unboundedorg or Miss MS Lacey Robinson. They can find me on Facebook, same thing, unboundedorg or Miss. Lacey Robinson with MS. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, shoot me a DM. I can't promise I'm going to be able to answer it all the time. You know, I'm not as, I ain't got cute people supporting me like the way Tiffany do. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I could try to get to the messages. <laughs> yeah, so again, get you a copy. We're going to put a link, um, hopefully in that show description. I'll get Imani, our um, our amazing, beautiful brown um um, producer to put the link for Justice Seekers in our show notes. Justice Seekers by Lacey Robinson. Yeah, I just, I love that there are people like you continuing the work in the education space where so many of us were like, tap out, tap out. You know, <laughs> we can't all tap out. Some of us got to tap in. And so I'm so glad that you're there. Thank you so much for coming, Lacey. You're really amazing. Oh my God. Thank you so much for having me, Tiffany. You are such an angel. I want you to understand that. You really are. Your words of wisdom carry us through. So I just really appreciate everything that you do uh, for us. Uh, and you still are a teacher girl. You yes. just teaching in a different class. Ooh, yes, okay. I am. Loki, I can, yes. <laughs> <laughs> y'all hopefully you enjoyed it share this um with your favorite teacher educator because you know she need to hear it because they be (laughs) or he or they they somebody Mm -hmm. needs to hear it um yeah and we will see you so i'm asking Lacey's actually going to stay for our baqa so you know tune in on friday because we're gonna get some questions (laughs) answered um and until next week bye y'all bye (laughs) hey 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 ba fan we're on youtube woohoo Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. And while you're at it, why don't you go over to that little bell icon and just tap that for us. Show the BA fam how much you love us. And that way you'll also get notifications when new videos drop. Also share the channel with a friend. We're always like, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend. And thank y'all so much again for all the support.